Uh, you could turn to Psalm 24. That's where we're going to uh, start this morning as we consider Jesus, uh, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, and then um, ending this morning, we're going to end on uh, Good Friday, Jesus uh, on the cross on our behalf. I was thinking, uh, you know how sometimes you just think about things and you wonder, you know, why you were thinking? I know why I was thinking about this, but uh, so it just starts strange, okay? So I was thinking about the 1988 Summer Olympics, okay? Kind of an odd thing to be thinking about, right? Um, but you guys, most of you probably know that uh, I grew up in Canada, so uh, as I was uh, uh, young in 1988, and I'm still young, but <laughs> you got to remember, so in 1988, Canada won 10 medals at the Summer Olympic Games, okay? So not, not like, I think the U.S. that year won 94, so for every medal the U.S. won, Canada won one medal. So uh, you could imagine... Maybe, maybe you were watch, some of you were watching the same race. The 100 meter final, 1988 Olympics, um, in, I think it was in Seoul. Seoul? Seoul? Seoul, Korea. The headline, Ben Johnson against Carl Lewis. You guys probably don't know who Ben Johnson is, but he's the Canadian sprinter who ran on that day and finished first with a new world record 9.79 seconds. Okay, so as a, as a young Canadian boy, top of the world, right? This was my country, especially because we beat Carl Lewis in the U.S. So you could imagine three days later when the newspaper comes out, gold medal stripped Ben Johnson used steroids. Oh. Like for three days, we, we were on top of the world. Like what, what event do you want to win the gold in at the Summer Olympics but the 100 meters, right? And, and then we just, oh. such excitement to just like utter disappointment. Have you felt that swing of emotion before? Maybe not over that race, right? <laughs> um, but anyways, the, the reason, okay, why are you thinking about that, Jeff? Well, the reason I was thinking about that is I'm trying to imagine the range of emotions for a Jewish person living in Jerusalem when Jesus enters into the city being hailed as the Savior. We sang Hosanna this morning. Being hailed as the Savior, the Redeemer, the one that would take care of everything. And at the end of the week, he's being buried in a tomb. The, the swing of emotions that would have been felt uh, that week. So as we prepare uh, for Easter next Sunday, I want to I just think about Jesus as the King this morning and, and maybe go from that emotional high on Sunday to the, to the low that the people would have felt on that Friday when Jesus was buried. So let, let me pray, and we're going to uh, look start in Psalm 24. Father, we're so grateful uh, for your son. We're thankful for Jesus. We're going to look at him today, how he's our king. And we celebrate that this morning. We sang about that this morning. And as we look into your word, though, we see that there's, there's quite a lot of differing opinions and thoughts and emotions when it comes to Jesus. And even if we look at our world today, some of those same things still exist. So God, I ask that you would help us to see from your word today what is true, what is right, what you've done for us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm 24 may be a strange place to start on, on uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, it said, though, that this was a messianic psalm, psalm, a psalm that spoke about the Messiah uh, who was to come. Uh, scholars suggest that maybe the first time this psalm would have been sung was when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem for the first time. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant basically represented God to the people of Israel. So as God came into Jerusalem, and, and, and as the Ark came into Jerusalem, perhaps they sung this psalm. Tradition says, though, that um, as time went on, that this psalm was read on the first day of the week, every week, in the temple. 
Well, kind of an interesting, it's where we're going to start this morning, um, so bear with me, my glasses are at home. I'm, it's not that bad, really, it's just helpful. <laughs> this is what it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. What a great reminder for us any day of the week, right? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all the people in it, they all belong to the Lord. It's a a verse that helps us to shape our worldview. God is the creator. This is the world that God created. If God created this this world, then it makes sense that he had an order and a plan and and guidelines and rules that should be followed in, in order for us to live uh, a life that God intended for us. Uh, so uh, it, it shapes this idea and it, and, it, and it puts us in a position to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that we should put our faith and our trust in him. The alternative is that there is no God. We're just here by chance. And so you can make it up as you go along. You are, you are your own boss. You make your own rules and you do as you please. And it's, it's not really a great alternative. So the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Verse three says this, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has a, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Okay, verse three here. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, who can come into the presence of God? Isn't that a great question? It's a question that we all have to answer. If he's the, if he's the God who created all things, how can we approach him? In our Thursday morning Bible study, uh, John quoted Miles Stanford, who, who said this, there are two questions that every believer must settle as soon as possible. The one is, does God fully accept me? And the second, if so, upon what basis does he do so? So how do we find acceptance before God? Now, of course, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So you can read verse 4 here, and it says, it kind of gives us an answer. Well, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. He doesn't lift up his soul to what is false. He does not swear deceitfully. So some would read this and think, I'm out. I don't meet, I, I don't meet the standard. And just as unfortunately, some would read this and say, I think I could do that. We know from our study of the Old Testament that an Israelite would never presume that he could go, he or she could go to the temple before God empty handed. What would they bring with them? They would bring, they would bring an offering to be sacrificed. So this is one of the reasons this is a messianic psalm, I think, is because this is what describes Jesus. Jesus went, Jesus is the one who went up the hill with a clean heart, excuse me, with clean hands and a pure heart. We can't do that, can we? In the Old Testament, they brought a sacrifice. Now today, Jesus has gone before us and he has died for us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus goes before us. I don't want anyone to think that if you just clean yourself up, that you can stand before God. No, we need Jesus. Verse five says that, that the blessings come from the Lord, but even says, and righteousness comes from the God of his salvation. Okay, keep reading. Now, as we read this, uh, these last few verses, picture this as sort of a, a back and forth. Okay, the entourage is approaching the city of Jerusalem, and, and, and they call out, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. 
Lift up your heads, O gates, and, let, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. So the, the entourage comes up and he says, the, the, the group of people bringing, remember this is a, a messianic psalm, so perhaps the first time it was sung, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant, but as the Messiah comes in, the entourage calls out, look up, gatekeeper, open the, the gates of the city so that the king could come in. And the gatekeeper calls back, who is this king of glory? And the entourage says, he's the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Look up, gatekeeper, open the doors that the king could come in. And the gatekeeper says, who is this king of glory? And they respond, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. So perhaps when the ark was first come, definitely looking ahead to when the Messiah would come into the city. So we read. So we're starting there, but then we're going. We are going to go to Matthew chapter twenty-one, and this is the this is one of the places where where it describes Jesus coming into the city on that Palm Sunday. He's near the end of his earthly ministry. Um, he's approaching Jerusalem on the first day of the week. He spent three years with his disciples, teaching, discipling, ministering, healing, forgiving sins. The, the disciples, they borrowed a donkey, and Jesus sat on the donkey and was riding the donkey uh, up the hill into Jerusalem. Um, they are, they're throwing their coats on the ground. They're waving palm branches. Let's, let's read it together. Matthew 21, starting verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage, to the Mount Olive, Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you will say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. This is out of Zechariah 9.9. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of beast of burden. So the disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and colt and put on them their cloaks, and he, Jesus, sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So the the procession is taking place. This entourage is going up towards Jerusalem. They're throwing their cloaks on the ground. They're throwing the palm branches on the ground. Jesus is riding on a colt, much like a a king would come into the city for his coronation. And they're calling out, Hosanna to the son of David. Uh, Salvation, they're calling out. Hosanna means salvation, or it means save us or redeem us. Salvation to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Salvation in the highest. It's It's a big celebration. They're on top of the world. Here's the one. He's gonna save them. He's their king. And in in Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 37 and 38, it it says that they call him the king. So parallel account says, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king, blessed is the king, they're calling, who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It is a big celebration. They're calling him the son of David. They're calling him their king. And when he entered Jerusalem, verses uh, 10 and 11 in Matthew 21, the city was stirred up, it says, and they said, who is this? And the entourage said back to them, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So we, we have to be careful about jumping to the conclusions when we're studying scripture, especially when we're, we're, when we're looking at uh, what's, 
you know, sort of traditional things, but it certainly seems that the priests and the Levites are in the temple on the first day of the week, and part of what they did that morning was read Psalm 24. They would have been reading uh, and giving praise to God as their creator and looking forward to the day when the Messiah would come up the hill and into the gates of Jerusalem and they would say, who is this? And they would answer, it's the king of glory. And at some point on that day, Jesus, with an entourage of his disciples, comes up the, the hill, they're calling out to their king, they're celebrating the one that would save them, and when he comes into the gates, they said, who is this guy? They didn't quite say he's the king of glory. They said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Psalm 24 being, being, being played out right before their eyes as they said it at some point during that day. And then Jesus entering the city on that Palm Sunday. There was confusion over who Jesus was that day. Is he just Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son? Uh, they, they said that they were aware of his, his works. Is, is he just some, some sort of miracle man? We're not sure where his power comes from. Is he just a good teacher that would taught good morals for a few years? They seemed to think he was more than that. They were, calling, they were calling Jesus their king. They thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was the one who was coming to... Uh, bring peace and prosperity to the Israelite nation and uh, dispose of the Roman, Roman rule and the Roman empire that was oppressing them. I would say there's still a lot of confusion today over who Jesus is. Like the same questions are being asked. Who, who, who was Jesus is usually how it's asked, Right? We would say, who is Jesus, fully believing that he's still alive today? Was he just a prophet? Was he just a teacher? Was he some sort of magician, you know, just making some of these things, like, did he trick all these people to believe some of these mirac miraculous things took place? What power and authority does he really have? Like, do we really need to follow his teachings, or were they just for a time, and now we do what we want? If I were to ask you this morning, who is Jesus? To you personally, how would you answer that? I believe scripture is really clear when he describes him as king in, in some of these passages we've been in and we're going to look at it, continue to look at it. John chapter 18. John chapter 18 verse 33. So the triumphant entry on, on the first day of the week, and, and now fast forward to Friday. He's done some teaching, um, he's told some parables, uh, he cleared out the temple. A, a bunch of things have happened during the course of the week. He had the, uh, the Last Supper, as we call it, the Last Supper with his disciples. He was arrested in the garden, and now on Friday, uh, he's, he's, they're throwing him back and forth. Uh, nobody really wants to take responsibility for him. He ends up in Pilate, uh, in front of Pilate, uh, who's the Roman governor. Verse 33, read this with me. Pilate entered his headquarters again, <clears throat> second time he's talked to him, and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it? To you about me. I'm sure Pilate, you know, Jerusalem's not that big of a city. So Pilate knows what's happening in and around and what's going on. So he, he's kind of heard what's going on, but Jesus says, are you asking it of your own accord or did somebody put you up to it? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and their chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. 
Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So five days pass. Jesus has gone from being this triumphant king to uh, been put on trial. He's in front of the Roman governor. And Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? I kind of go back and forth. Let me just read verse 36 again with you. This is Jesus' answer. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Well, what's Jesus the king of then? I said already, at this time, the Jews were looking for a Messiah, one who would uh, rise to power with great signs and wonders. That's what the Old Testament uh, uh, said of the Messiah. He would establish a new kingdom on earth, bringing peace and prosperity to the Jewish nation. Is this not who Jesus was? Before Christmas, we were reminded, we looked at some passage that um, there's some of the prophecy about the Messiah, such as Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, should be on the screen, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Some of these promises were not fulfilled when Jesus came the first time but will be fulfilled at his second coming. We looked at this in Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Um, and and uh, speaking of Jesus, or God made him, God made Jesus for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Ver, uh, continuing, it says in verse 8, now putting, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control, yet at present we do not see yet excuse me, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So Christ rules and reigns, nothing is outside of his control, even at the present time, even though at the present time not everything in in creation is subject to him. So when we look at the the rule and reign of Christ, there is a sense that he uh, rules over the world. Psalm 24, we read it, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But Jesus didn't come in his first coming to establish an earthly kingdom. He said twice, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. So what will that heavenly kingdom look like? Well, in Romans 8, 23 Uh, Speaking to believers, it says that those who have the Spirit of God groan as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. In other words, they weren't expecting the redemption of their bodies in this world, but that in the future kingdom of God, there would be a redemption of our bodies. Uh, In fact, in Revelation, we read that everything will be made new. There'll be a new heaven, there'll be a new earth, God will dwell with his people, no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more pain. And yet those are all things we experience in this world, aren't they? We deal with those things in this world because of the curse. So it's not until Jesus returns to establish his heavenly kingdom that we will have complete relief from these things. So what aspects of the kingdom can we say that we experience today? Well, the redemption of our souls The Holy Spirit indwells in us. We've given a new life. We're given every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 7 tells us. Those are the things that we're promised in this life. And the future kingdom that is to come, the absence of sickness, the absence of pain, the absence of death, the presence of God, a new heavens, a new earth, new Jerusalem. It's the future heavenly kingdom. Jesus is the king. I said we're going to end with Jesus on the cross this morning. So you can turn with me to Mark chapter 15. uh, Starting in verse 16. We'll read some here together. So Jesus was in front of Pilate. Pilate's asking him, who are you? 
essentially Pilate said, look, I don't find anything wrong with him, but I'm going to wash my hands of him. He's like, you, you guys do what you want to do with him. He offered to let him go, uh, let one prisoner go free. You know, Barabbas, the, the terrible criminal, or Jesus, they said, we want, uh, let Barabbas go free and crucify Jesus. Uh, so, so Pilate washed his hands of him, wanting to satisfy the crowd. So we're picking up here in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16. And just, just consider with me through these verses how Jesus was treated for our, on our, for, for, for our sake. It says, The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. They were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him. And kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his own clothes. And they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby, Simon who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each would take. That casting of the lots fulfills a a prophecy in Psalm 22, verse 18. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. That's what Pilate had put on a sign on the top of the cross. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 53. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. So all the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, the Roman of all people, who was standing facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Who's Jesus to you? A carpenter? Good teacher, moral prophet, the son of God. Would you call him your savior this morning? Do you believe that, that, that his death that we just read one account of paid the price for the sins that you've committed and that his resurrection gives us hope in death and the promise of everlasting life. Is Jesus your king? 
We're going to take some time to consider that this morning as we uh, take communion together. Um, Why don't I pray and then just share a, a few thoughts. Father, we do recognize you as our king this morning. It seems that the, that the people of Jerusalem thought you were a king for just a moment. And by the end of the week, most of them had changed their minds. Yet, Lord, as we read this, this account, we see that you were the king as you came into Jerusalem. You were also our king as you hung on that cross. You were our king when they buried you. And you are a king when you rose from the dead three days later. We're looking forward to celebrating your resurrection next week. God, I pray as we consider what you did for us this morning, that we would just think personally for a minute. My prayer is that each one of us would consider who you are. Maybe there's some here this morning that have never put their faith and trust in Jesus. They've never, they've never looked at Jesus and recognized that he's God's son. And that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life and he died a death that he didn't deserve. That we might have life that we don't deserve. Now when we put our faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross... He takes our sin from us and he gives us his righteousness. If you've never, if you're here this morning, you've never done that. It's just as simple as talking to God and saying, God, I I recognize that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for me in my place on that cross. I believe he rose from the dead. And that by the power of his resurrection, we can have new life today. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Thank you for going to the cross for me, because I needed it. Thank you for going to the cross for anyone who call out on your name. Thank you, Jesus.